Good day to you. We are reading in the Gospel of Luke, the book of Luke. We have uh, read chapter 13 in our previous session, and in the end of that, um, some Pharisees had warned Jesus that Herod wanted to kill him, and uh, he had basically just moved on. Um, so we're ready to read chapter 14. Remember, we're reading the uh, context to understand what is happening and to understand what is being said so that we may apply it to our lives and live a, uh, <clears throat> a stronger Christian life following Jesus. So again, this is the uh, book of Luke, and this is going to be chapter 14. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Well, of course not. I mean, for as... Yes, the Sabbath day had been established by God for men as a day to rest. It was not meant to be a point of condemnation. It was not meant to be um, a rule by which you would be condemned for breaking. It was meant to be an opportunity to rest from the week's work and labors, you know. And it was as an example. It wasn't meant to be a hard and fast law. Um... But they had a tendency, the Pharisees, to go letter of the law and to take everything as a hard and fast rule um, by which people would be condemned for not following. However, they knew that they had people who, who still had to work on the Sabbath day. You know, they had people who had to tend flocks, take care of, of uh, feeding animals and things. They didn't just ignore them that one day of the week. Um, so... There were still things that had to be done. Uh, anyway, so Jesus was just trying, you know, to make a point to uh, get them to see that there was certainly nothing wrong with healing on the Sabbath. If you could do these other mundane things, then certainly having a miracle performed on the Sabbath would be fine. And surely, you know, God does not mind that. <clears throat> Now he told a parable to those who were invited. This is verse 7, sorry. Now he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a very practical thing as well as a spiritual thing. When you go, when you're invited somewhere or you go somewhere, whether it be church or wherever, you know, don't try to go and sit in the place of honor or what you think is the place of honor like you deserve um, to be honored above others. Instead, you know, um, allow, allow for others to receive honor and be honored and, uh, you know, keep yourself humble and realize that you're not the greatest person in the room. You know, when uh, when you go places and do things, sometimes I realize when you go do certain things or see certain things, you are going to want to sit up front. Maybe you want to see your kids play or whatever. That's that's a different type of situation. But um, we should not think too highly of ourselves, and we should not try to put ourselves in the preferred spots all the time. But rather give you know give place and give room for others. Um, Anyway, don't think too highly of yourself. That's the, that is probably the end of that. But uh, I just like the practicalness of that example. So, verse 12. 
He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Um, another excellent example of what we should do and how we should be. Um, and maybe giving a dinner is not always the best example, but nonetheless it's a good practical example, but it could be any number of things you should do to help the poor and the needy. Um, so, verse 15, When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many, and at the time for the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Let's see, where am I? I think I've gone too far, have I? Let me scroll this up here a little bit. All right. So the servant came and reported this, these things to his master. And my pages are sticking together. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my banquet. Well, here... Here we go. My page is still sticking together. So here we have this person given a banquet, and they've invited their, I guess, who they thought were their friends and who they thought would come and, and enjoy the, the banquet with them, the, the celebration. And each one of them made excuses, and these excuses to me make no sense. <laughs> I don't understand why this would keep you. You know, I've bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Well... Obviously, you saw it before you bought it, or you would not have bought it. So I don't understand why do you need to go out and see it. This, these, these are people just making excuses. Um, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Well, obviously, you examined them before you bought them. So, you know. And then, I've married a wife. This is the least understandable. I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And, and I've heard my preacher talk about this, too. This this excuse makes no sense. <laughs> How would that keep you from coming to the banquet? Uh, I don't understand. So, anyway. So, the people who were invited to the feast made excuses and did not want to come. So, here... The, the master of the house says, well, then go out in the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And they still had room, so he says, go out in the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, you know. So, because the ones that they invited were not interested. They made excuses. They did not want to come to the feast, so. And there's quite a bit to be said about that, I suppose. That is that is much like us um, when we make excuses for not following God and for not coming to the kingdom of God. And you know, all right. So that you know, I mean, that is what that is a parable for that people are invited. You know, God invites everyone to come to the kingdom of God. He invites everyone to be baptized, to uh, be a part of his family. And yet, so many make excuses, a lot of different excuses, and they don't become a part of the family. And so then they never, they never come to the feast. They never, they never get there. And that's, that's when it becomes really sad. All right.
So we're going to move forward. Verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him who comes with against him with twenty thousand? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Okay, so here Jesus is talking about following him and basically counting the kingdom as more important than everything else. Okay. He does not literally mean that we should hate our fathers and our mothers and our wives and our children and, uh, and our own lives. Now, maybe we should hate our past lives, sure, uh, the things we've done and said that were wrong, but he doesn't literally mean that you should hate each other. Um, that's not correct. But he's just saying, by comparison, we should be seeking the kingdom we should be following Jesus and that should be our main focus and that should be more important than everything else so this is kind of like with the uh, with some of the previous things we've read where Jesus said you know better to cut your hand or foot off well he doesn't want you to literally cut your hand or foot off but he wants you to get the sin out well in this case he wants you to um, to follow him first to count uh, the kingdom as more important and to seek first okay to seek first the kingdom of God. Okay? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We do. We each have to, you know, we each have to bear our own cross. We have to um, sacrifice our old life, our old selves on the cross uh, with him. We have to get rid of those things and it takes time it's not a, an instant thing but it takes time we have to daily work out our salvation and get rid of these things that are bad you know we need to be studying and praying about all of this um, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost I mean so we have to Pardon me. We have to realize that we're going to move away from our old lives. We're going to give up things. We're going to move forward. But we count that cost. We realize we're going to have to do those things, and we do them. Um, it may take time. It may not be a perfectly you know, instantaneous thing. It's not going to be that way. But we're going to count the cost, and we're going to eliminate those things from our lives over time. Um... And he also makes the uh, comparison of like, um, you look and see what you're about to do, and if you have 10,000 versus 20,000, well maybe, yeah, you should send out a, a delegation and ask for terms of peace. So, we have to be willing to renounce all that he has, you know. Um, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. We basically have to be able to say, look, all of this is just stuff. All of this other stuff is just stuff, and these are people, but what comes first is God. What comes first is uh, the Bible and prayer and caring about one another before ourselves. And, you know, and that's more important than these things that we have, these worldly things and the money and stuff like that. So then we have verse 34, and this is the last of the chapter here. Verse 34 and 35, Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, if we do not have our spirituality, if we do not count God as the most important thing, if we do not follow 
his ways and believe in him first and place him first above all others then we won't have <clears throat> you know we won't be the salt of the earth to be the salt of the earth we have to follow God we have to place God first and we have to work towards those goals of helping others and doing what we can for the kingdom of God which really just involves loving and caring for each other here on this earth um, and if we don't have that if we don't do that then we're basically worthless we're pointless in our lives and what we're doing and says he who has ears to hear let him hear well he just means you know let him who hears understand or or um, if you have understanding then listen it's this word here is not always here uh, it, it means like hear and understand like truly listen so Jesus is just saying he who has ears to hear to understand to truly listen let him let him listen and understand so that's the end of chapter 14 in our next session we'll do uh, chapter 15 thank you for your time I hope this has been helpful and uh, God bless you. You have a wonderful day.